Don, we're here at this another FQXI conference, and uh, in dealing with some of the fundamental questions of quantum physics and cosmology, people are also talking about consciousness, the physics of consciousness. To me, trained in neuroscience, that is kind of astonishing that people at, who deal with the most fundamental parts of, of physics, many orders of magnitude below what's happening in the brain, are making uh, 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 creative contributions uh, to what the nature of consciousness. Now, now, neuroscience hasn't been able to really explain consciousness, so maybe we need to deal with the, with the underlying physics? Well, I, because quantum theory is the fundamental description we have in physics, I would like to express the relationship between consciousness and physics in terms of this fundamental description of physics. I'm not denying that it might not be a very good approximation to use the approximation of classical physics to describe consciousness, but I, I just I would like to understand the relation between consciousness and, and the fundamental level of physics. So therefore, I've formulated something that I, I sometimes call sensible quantum mechanics because it has to do with, <laughs> with sensations, really, really sentient experiences or, or conscious perceptions, all that one's aware of at once. And then once I did write something for lay people, I called it mindless sensationalism, <laughs> because in this, what was fundamental was the sentient experiences and not sequences of them that might be called minds. But it, so I have a framework. It's not a theory, and I'll explain why it's not a theory in, in, in the terms. And that says that there's something called the quantum state of the universe. This is, this is what we, we would get from quantum physics. But then it would, it would say for each sentient experience, each, each possible total experience of, of first person awareness, there is, a, there is a corresponding positive quantum operator. And a quantum operator is, is, is something that the quantum state gives, assigns a number to. So if it's a positive quantum operator, it would assign a positive number to this thing. And the idea is that this positive number would represent what we call the measure or what would would be to, to what extent does this sentient experience exist? So if you had the, the, the operator for, for say getting uh, a, thousand he, a thousand coins, a fair coins, all heads, then the, the measure for that would be very tiny because it's extremely improbable to get all of a thousand, a thousand coins thrown as heads. On the other hand, if you ask for, you know, say 500 heads, then the probability is, is 500 heads, 500 tails, the, the probability is much higher, so I would think that the measure of the corresponding sentient experience of experiencing that you got that result would also be much higher. So it's a framework for saying that the measures for sentient experiences are given by the expectation values of corresponding positive operators in the quantum state of the universe. The reason it's not a theory is that I do not know what these operators are. So to, f to flesh it out, you would have to know what the operators are. Well, you'd also have to know what the quantum state of the, of, of the universe is. But if you knew the quantum state and you knew the operators, and of course, if this framework were, were, were right, then at least it would tell you how much of each sentient experience occurs. And how does this help us to understand the phenomenal internal subjective nature of consciousness more than a neuroscientist sitting here who would say that it's uh, the uh, corticothalamic system in the brain firing uh, X number of neurons at a certain pattern, which is uh, huge numbers of orders of magnitude higher than what's working in the quantum system in all, in all of those neurons. How well, I think, if, I, I, I think, of course, if, if, if you could then translate this, this conditions in, in the brain into, into quantum terms, then, then what the neuroscientists find that could be information about what these operators are. See, I'm leaving what the operators are as agnostic. I'm just putting a framework. And so they would be doing the, the nitty gritty work, which is much harder than my, you know, my tiny contribution as to just what the framework is. Oh, I, I understand that. But at the end of the day, you, you have to, if, if the project is, uh, is understood, to explain the internal phenomenal experience. Not, not, you're, not, you're not explaining how uh, I'm moving my arm or seeing red, right, right. but how I'm feeling it inside. And so I, I, I just don't understand how any physical system as we know it today, be it at the quantum level or be it at the neuronal level, can literally be this phenomenal experience. Yeah, that's a mystery I think that David Chalmers has called the hard problem. And I'm not sure that this would, 
at, at, at some level, you might say it doesn't really explain it, but, it, but, if, but if it does describe, if it says exactly what does happen in the situation, it, 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 it's at least a partial explanation. I mean, of course, one could say a similar thing. You could say, how could, you poss how could a particle ever have a, an electric field associated with it? Hmm. And I, I don't know that physics really explains that, but it does say we have the equations that, that imply that for each charged particle there's an mm -hmm. associated electric field coming out of it. An electron has an electric field coming out of it. Mm -hmm. And so we have a description of how strong this electric field is. It depends on the charge of the particles. And I guess it's a little bit of an open question is, does that really explain why the field is there? It gives a good description. And that's at least the first stage that we would want. And I think David Chalmers was telling me today that you know he would be happy with that if he, if we had if we had a good description that we were able to predict the, the sentient experiences from the quantum state, then that might be all that you could expect science to, to answer. Now, when you, when you're doing that, you're using uh, uh, the quantum state in in all of these neurons, however how, however it's working, to to give us a framework to think better about it. So. My only my question is that same uh, quantum analysis is occurring in in this chair, my pants, the floor, e everything in the world. What's so special about the quantum states and, and operators occurring in in the brain? It, it, does that is it, it's, it's something special in the brain that's helping it, or it's the same quantum activity that's going on everywhere? Well, these operators, of course, in some sense, they're looking for particular situations. I mean, in in some crude sense, the this, this measure that you get out from the operator in some sense says how nearly is the brain state to that described by the operator. So if the operator is looking for a brain in some particular configuration, or well, it's looking, it's looking for some matter that's in a particular configuration that would be, say, what a, what a normal conscious human brain would have. Okay, so we're saying that, that if then it finds that matter in the brain, but it doesn't find it in your knee. It, it looks, it looks, it looks all over your knee and your toe and everywhere else to see is there, is there there some structure that would produce the consciousness? And if what produces the consciousness is like some particular structure in, in a normal human brain, then it's of course extremely unlikely to find that same structure in the knee, which just has a, you know, a different structure. When you say it's looking, what, what's the it? Well, the it would be, I'm sort of anthropomorphizing yeah, yeah, exactly. this, this operator. Okay. I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to describe the, the, quantum the expectation by this operator is that in some, it's as if this operator is trying to look for situations that correspond to particular configurations. And if it's, if, if consciousness is produced by brain, config, certain brain configurations, it's looking for those brain configurations. And I'm sort of, I'm saying that in some sense, it doesn't matter where these configurations are. But of course, in reality, we find them, we find them inside human brains and, we, and, and we're extremely, well, for all practical purposes, we don't find them you know, in other parts of the human body or, 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 you know, or in inanimate objects and, 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 and so on. Now, it's an open question whether different configurations corresponding to perhaps sufficiently intelligent uh, computers might also be sufficient to produce consciousness. That would be a different, maybe it would be a different operator that was looking for some particular computer thing. And I'm agnostic as to, you know, to what extent any present computers, whether any of these operators might find consciousness within, you know, any present, I'm rather skeptical that in present computers they would find very much consciousness.